Hello, my name is Jen S. and on behalf of the Denver Postcard Club, I would like to welcome you to this presentation. The Denver Postcard Club meets every second Sunday at the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library in Denver. If you would like additional information about the club, I invite you to visit our website at www.denverpostcardclub.org. Now, without further delay, I will turn the meeting over to our presenters, Lee and Jane Whiteley who will take us on a journey to the land of colorful canyons. Okay, well, first of all, have anybody here heard of lantern slides? It goes back uh, many, many years. Uh, I don't know the full process involved with creating one of these lantern slides, but I know it's, it's uh, projecting an image onto glass. And then there would be usually a colorist, a person who would often hand tint this image on this piece of glass. Then a second glass plate would be on top with a little black basking tape around the edge to keep the dust out. So these like three and a half by four inch colorized photographs on glass. And these originally started out more as a toy. Way back in the 1800s, uh, there were little toy projectors and these little uh, cartoon characters and various slogans and so forth on glass that the kids would be able to wonderfully project onto a screen with a magic lantern. It was so unique and magic that it became known as a lantern slide, a magic lantern slide. These were used primarily for educational purposes and for business meetings. Actually, what they were were predecessors of the 2x2 two two slides, which came out first in 1938. And with these lantern slides, you would have a projector. You would put the little lantern slide in here and move it over and it would project on the wall. Now this projector works, but the fan is kind of gone and it gets so hot without a fan that what we do is digitize them for this program. Now this all started about 45 years ago. We're collectors, we collect a lot of stuff, uh, arcade games, lunch boxes. It was only recently well, like 20 years ago that we started with postcards. But back in about 1978, we loved to go to antique stores and shops. And we went up to something called the Longmont Pumpkin Pie Days. Some of you older people might remember the old pumpkin pie days held twice a year. And we were just looking around. We, we had no real intent to find anything specific. But... We love transportation. We love railroads, old highways, old trails. We love national parks. And so when we saw this little box of about 300 lantern slides, we just picked a couple out and we were lucky enough to pick out a slide that showed a train and put it back, picked up another one, national park. And I said, hey, this kind of fits in with our real interest, which is railroads and national parks. And we bought this box of lantern slides about 350 of them. Most of them pertain to the Mormon religion. We have a lot of lantern slides, a couple hundred of them, that pertain to missionary work by the Mormons and a lot of agriculture pictures. But we did find about 75 lantern slides that pertained to railroads and the national parks. And as we studied about this, it all related to the national park-to-park -park this Union Pacific system and their tour of Zion, Bryce, Grand Canyon, and Cedar Breaks National Parks and Monument. And this was one of the very first slide programs we did many, many years ago, but they were very primitive programs. It wasn't until I found out that my iPhone could take excellent reproductions of these lantern slides that we were able to produce the program you're going to see now. Okay, today we're going to talk about the Union Pacific and their promotion of national parks. The national parks have always 
relied heavily on the railroads. We had railroads that actually brought people to the national parks. The railroads built some of the big lodges. Uh, for example, this is the north entrance to Yellowstone. The, the Northern Pacific would bring passengers to the north entrance. You would transfer to these touring buses for a tour of Yellowstone. We had Glacier National Park served by the Great Northern Railroad. The same thing here, the, the, the big hotels were basically financed by the railroad. Crater Lake and the Southern Pacific Railroad. Again, the very promotion of these parks by the railroads that served them. The Santa Fe to the Grand Canyon. We know about the El Tomar Hotel that was built by the Santa Fe Railroad. And then we come to Colorado, which was served by the Union Pacific Railroad. This, of course, is Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, the Union Pacific didn't come too close to the park, but it was transfer places in the Denver area that would take people to Rocky Mountain National Park. But to get to our real topic today, we want to go to Zion, Bryce Canyon, and Grand Canyon National Park, North Rim. And again, here's a little promotional brochure, Union Pacific Railroad. And here's a nice little map showing Cedar City, Utah. And they would visit Zion, North Rim of the Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon, and Cedar Breaks National Monument. And a very nice little, little schematic showing the tour route. After 1958, when the railroad no longer ran to Cedar City, uh, the train would stop in Lund, Utah, about 30 miles away. And here's a car at the Lund station with a very nice little mural billboard promoting the national parks. And people would off the train and stay at the El Escalante Hotel in Cedar City. This no longer stands. And then you would transfer to these wonderful little touring buses, which would take you through the various parks and between the parks. And then we had something called the Sing Away. Look at all the employees on the left. As people were about to leave Bryce after their visit to Bryce, the employees would come out and sing a, long, a little song that would say, we're glad you're here, have safe journeys. And they actually had a little sing-away medley that would tell the people what a wonderful time you had here, enjoy the rest of your tour. And of course, postcards. The Union Pacific, of course, had many postcards of various places like the Kebab Squirrel at the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. They had very nice views of, like, Zion Canyon itself and Angel's Landing. But then we come to the lantern slides. This was primarily a set of lantern slides that a promoter would use probably back east, like in Chicago or Omaha. He would present a program similar to exactly like I'm going to present now, to encourage people to sign up with the Union Pacific Railroad will take you right to the national parks. Total package, seven or eight day package, will take care of everything. And these are the little lantern slides, and we talked a little bit about that. And the projector. And so this is kind of a, a program that, that a promoter for the Union Pacific would present to various groups, primarily back east. And of course, <laughs> at the beginning of the program, they'd say, loud talking or whistling not allowed. This is a lantern slide, but it was not included in the set that we want. And of course, we will take the Overland Limited, uh, through Kansas, through Nebraska, to Salt Lake City. Uh, this would be following the Transcontinental Railroad uh, route, which was completed in 1869. 
you would come to Strawberry Point in Utah. This would be in Ogden Canyon before you get down to Ogden. And the interior of the Union Pacific Railroad car. This was the very nice lounge chair at the end of the train. You could see people out on the back observation platform. And then our first stop on our tour would be Zion National Park. And here's a very nice uh, picture of some of the girls visiting the park. The old peach orchard before it became a national monument and then a national park. This was quite a, a little Mormon settlement in the canyon and they raised a lot of fruit in their various orchards. And then as you enter Zion Canyon itself, the very first mountain you would see, the main landmark, would be the Watchman. And this is kind of at the south end of the canyon. And in the foreground is the Virgin River. And this is the river that carved Zion Canyon. The lodge, this was completed in the 1920s, again with the help of the Union Pacific Railroad and a lot of cabins associated with it, still in operation today. We have the three brothers as we now continue up the canyon. The Great White Throne, the huge big mountain, and Zion National Park, and this is artist Fairbanks. This individual would spend several summers back in the 1920s uh, basically trying to capture some of the scenic beauty of Zion. And Angel's Landing. You can actually hike to the top of Angel's Landing. And here's a little slide of uh, the trail up to Angel's Landing. A view from above Angel's Landing. Well, once you, once you will get at the very top, you have a wonderful view of Zion Canyon itself. And there are horseback rides available to the East Rim and the West Rim. This is the West Canyon from Horse Pasture Plateau. And a very wonderful little eroded monument on the West Rim Trail. Then we have the Narrows. This is in Zion Canyon at the upper end of the, the canyon. This is where the canyon narrows drastically. But still, the Virgin River at times can, can flood this canyon. You have to be very mindful of the weather before you start a hike up the canyon. And here's four horsemen, and it just kind of shows you how narrow Zion Canyon becomes. And then we jump in our little tour buses and continue back through Hurricane, which was known as the Dixie of Utah. And this will take you into Arizona, the northern part of Arizona. And you would come to Pipe Springs National Monument, which was a, a, a landmark on the old Mormon honeymoon trail. And this had wonderful water in a very dry, desolate plain. This is a national monument today, worth visiting. And you also will pass by Battleship Rock as you come closer to Fredonia in northern Arizona. And then our next stop would be the Kebab Forest as you enter the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And of course, it's most well known for its white-tailed squirrel, the Kebab Squirrel, which is found only in the Kebab Forest at the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And here's a picture of one of the big meadows as you're driving to the North Rim. You see how nice and green everything is. Here you can see another view of the valley. And this is one of the problems with lantern slides. You can't believe everything you see. Whoever did the coloring on this was not the photographer. Because this is not a sea, this is green grass. And then we come to the Grand Canyon Lodge. This 
particular lodge here, this burned in 1932. The present one was rebuilt, reopened in 1937, but still a wonderful view and a wonderful patio and lounge area. Bright Angel Point, very short hike from the lodge, will bring you to this wonderful viewpoint of the Grand Canyon. Greatly admired. Actually, today you can't hike to the very top of that. You know, there's been a lot of restrictions and uh, so forth that have been imposed since the wild days of the 1920s. This is Cape Royal, north rim of the Grand Canyon. The north rim is actually at least a thousand feet higher than the south rim. The south rim is where most tourists visit. The North Rim is a totally different area as far as ecology, wildlife, etc. And Point Sublime, a rather long, arduous four-wheel drive trip will take you to Fort Sublime. And then we're heading back north, leaving the North Rim of the Grand Canyon through the little town of Kanab, Utah. And here are some uh, cliff dwellings someplace in the wonderful Escalante uh, Canyons National Monument. Never been there. They're keeping it a secret, I'm sure. Then, as we approach Rice Canyon National Park, we travel through Red Canyon. And for some reason, that little rock formation is called Duck on a Rock. And then we have Bryce Lodge. This also was built with the help of the Union Pacific Railroad. And of course, the highlight of any trip to the Bryce Canyon is first of all a hike along the top of the canyon. It's a gigantic amphitheater with all these very, very ornate eroded features caused primarily by the thawing and freezing of moisture, and it breaks apart these little rocks and produces all these wonderful little rock formations. And here you can see an individual overlooking the amphitheater from Inspiration Point. And this is the Great Natural Bridge. Again, you can no longer hike or take a horse to the top of this bridge. Actually, it's not a bridge, it's an arch. A lot of formations all have unique little names, like the Temple of Osiris. This, again, is Tower Bridge. And, of course, most tourists think they have seen Bryce if all they do is hike the very top of the amphitheater to get a real sense of the beauty and the architecture and nature's wonders, you have to take a hike, just like at the Grand Canyon. It's a whole different world. If you just take a five or 10 minute walk below the rim, you see a whole new entire different world. And here, this young lady, this is one of my favorite slides. This is the little picture we put on the the cover of our little booklet. And then more strange found formations at Cedar Breaks. After leaving Bryce, you head back towards Cedar City, Utah, and you pass a national monument. And this is called Cedar Breaks. And this is like a miniature Bryce Canyon. It's still interesting, has its own unique features, but it resembles a lot of the features in Bryce. And here's another view of Cedar Breaks. Then you come down Cedar Canyon on the road to Cedar Breaks. You come down this very, very wonderful canyon. And then you arrive back at Cedar City. You, re you jump on the train and there's a big optional stopover in Salt Lake City to visit the Mormon Temple. And also very interesting is the old Saltaire Resort. 
And this is a scene that you will not see today. But back in the old days, this was the second salt air. And you can see the, the, the swimmers just enjoying their, their buoyancy in the Great Salt Lake. And then you, unfortunately, jump on your train for your return trip east. And that basically completes the tour of the parks in Utah and the north rim of the Grand Canyon by the Union Pacific Railroad. I got a question. When you first started working your way down through the canyon, through not Bryce Canyon, Zion. Zion. Were you going from west to east or east to west? We're going from west? south to north. Okay, it's a north-south canyon. And, gotcha. and when you enter the canyon from the visitor center, there's <laughs> wide open meadows. It's a couple miles wide. You see the watchman directly ahead of you. And then as you turn north on the, the Zion Canyon road, the road, the, 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 the canyon narrows until you get to the very north end of the, the paved road, so to speak, then you proceed up the narrows. Lee, do you have any idea how much that eight-day excursion ran back in those days? Eighty-nine fifty for five, five days. five days. Includes motor bus transportation, 14 meals, and four lodgings. Mm -hmm. So yes, thank you. <laughs> Less than $100 for all that good scenery and food. So what year again did you find these slides? And then how long did it take you to put the slides in the order of the tour? I mean, they were in a box, right? They, they were, were a box. So loose about 350 box. lantern slides. The first thing we did, we bought them back in the late 70s, shortly after we were married. We had very little idea of exactly what was in those 350. We went through and sorted out everything that said National Park or anything to do with the railroad. And then we picked out about 20 and had a professional photographer go through his very fancy equipment to digitize them. And we gave a brief program in the late 70s on this topic. We set them aside oh, for about 40 years. <laughs> and then when I found out that my little That's iPhone true. could, you know, digitize these very fragile lantern mm -hmm. slides, then, then I developed this program. So I worked on it for several months back in the late 70s, mm -hmm. and then for a couple months just before the pandemic when this book came out. I saw that the book was uh, published in 2019. Yes. So did you have like the program kind of ready and then go to Zion and kind of check to make sure that you had everything in the right sequence? Oh, of course. Back oh, okay. in 2016, when we thought this might be a new project, we, we of course, had to go to all those places. <laughs> yes. And stay in the lodges, oh. eat yeah. at the lodges, oh, no. was, yeah. see the sides. Oh. Yeah. Uh, he took a bullet for us. Somebody had to do it. Somebody had to do it. <laughs> and how much did that trip cost? Uh, <laughs> more than eighty-nine fifty. More, more than eighty-nine fifty. Yes, we were lucky to get the last room available at the north rim of the Grand Canyon, the last cabin available at Bryce. It was a very special trip for us. Six-day trip through all the basically sites that's in the book, but. Uh, a lot has changed since here. Like, like there's a lot more restrictions. You can't climb up there. You can't climb over there. But uh, we did check it out. We did thoroughly check it out. But most of the research and everything had been done back in the late 70s. But then we made a tour of the parks, updated our thinking about what needs to go in the book, and then came out with the book. Were there many manufacturers of the lantern slides? Yes, a lot of different people. Amateurs, I mean, it was an easy process to take a picture 
but then it would just take a specialist to transfer them to glass. Mm. So there are many, many, quote, uh, photographers that took what you see on lantern slides, but the process of putting them on the glass and colorizing them uh, narrowed the, the number of companies down. Magic lantern slides were used heavily by the American military, especially the hospital service in World War I. Okay. For instructional purposes. Okay. Yes. Field instruction. Yes. When you went there, did you go on the tours? No, we didn't go on the tours because we had been to all those parks three or four times before this final trip. This okay. final trip we had samples of all the, the pictures that we wanted to put in the book so we could match them up and, and be more accurate in what we're saying in the book. But we have all, she's been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon by, by horse. We've taken a couple river trips through the canyon. So we knew the parks very well. Mm -hmm. Our last trip was just to uh, solidify our thinking in putting this book together and finding some of these exact then and now type mm -hmm. pictures. You have some. Do I have books for sale? <laughs> yes. Her pacemaker run the over. <laughs> <laughs> the, the trunk of my car has a spare tire, a jack, oh, yeah. and boxes of books. Oh, good. Okay. Well. When I went to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, I just simply took off, walked down the trail, went down the Bright Angel, went up to Kaibab, and just did it. Now, are there any restrictions on this hiking to the bottom of the Grand Canyon now? No, they're, no the, the trails are still wide open, just with precautions. People start down without water, in sandals, and they don't realize it's as many steps uphill as it is downhill. They get down an hour and think they can get back in an hour. So, yes, the trails are open, but uh, have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to do it in one day because... Phantom Ranch. Phantom Ranch. I mean, there was no rooms available. Yeah. And I was staying at the El Tovar, so it was a case of having to go back and going where I was staying, rather knowing that I couldn't stay at Phantom Ranch. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to, up and down one day. My son took a class they pedal down from here down to Grand Canyon, and that took about the four days to pedal down there. And they took the trip down, up, down to the bottom, up one side, and then back down the other side. That was a day trip. Mm -hmm. It was totally exhausting for okay. those kids. They were just, and this was about 12 years ago, and there were no restrictions at that time. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, thank you. On behalf of the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, I'd like to thank you for having taken the time to visit with us on this video. You'll find that this is one of a number of videos that we've produced over the years in the effort to provide educational services to the stamp collecting public. The Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library is located in Denver, Colorado, at 2038 South Pontiac Way. The library offers collectors of every kind and to the general public a host of materials that are related to stamp collecting and world history. There are over 60,000 journals contained in 800 specific journals. We have a map room, we have special collections devoted to individual countries, and we have special libraries that are devoted to individual countries. For further information about the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, we invite you to visit the library or visit us online at our website.